Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is part five of our six part series on consciousness in the brain with Professor Stuart Hameroff of the Banner University Medical Center at the University of Arizona, where he is professor of anesthesiology and psychology. He is the co founder and director of the Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona and author of. Ultimate Computing, Biomolecular Consciousness and Nanotechnology. Welcome back again, Stuart. Thank you, Jeffrey. Now, we're both wearing these colorful t-shirts, right. and, and I'm so pleased that you brought one for me today, <laughs> because the, these are the anniversary t-shirts that uh, show that you've been uh, organizing the uh, Science of Consciousness conferences now for more than 20 years. Yes, the first one that you attended in 19, was 1994, yes. and for the 20 year anniversary conference last year held in Tucson, we uh, commemorated it by borrowing this line from the Beatles, mm -hmm. Sgt. Pepper, it was 20 years ago today, Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play, and that famous iconic uh, album cover, which included uh, uh, at that time the Beatles and contemporary figures and historic figures, mm -hmm. so there have been a number of kind of knockoffs of this, yep. and after consulting with our legal department, we uh, we went ahead and did it, and it includes uh, contemporary figures, and being one of the organizers, I got to be one of the Beatles, along with Roger Penrose, David Chalmers, and Christoph Koch, and we have people from, uh, from Plato to Descartes to William James to modern scientists and philosophers, so uh, it got to be quite a, an end game deciding who was in and who was out, because we only had too many we only had so many uh, spots. Uh, Dave Chalmers and I mostly uh, arranged it with some input from uh, others, and uh, here it is. It's become uh, somewhat uh, popular as an image and uh, makes a pretty good t-shirt, I would say. Mm -hmm. And you also uh, let me know that the conference has now been renamed instead of being called Toward a Science of Consciousness, you're calling it science of consciousness. The science of consciousness. Yes, when we started, uh, you know, uh, because consciousness cannot be observed or measured directly, it's always been sort of philosophical, and, and some people use that to kind of ignore it or say it doesn't really exist, it's all an illusion, and, what it, you know, there's no big deal anyway, which I think is completely wrong. Uh, so uh, it's always been toward a science of consciousness, and there are, among us dualists, people who think that consciousness is really outside science. David Chalmers, for example, quite often is, is a dualist. So it's always been toward a science of consciousness. However, after, after 20 years, uh, uh, my new uh, co-chairman, George Mishore, suggested, uh, why don't we call it uh, the science of consciousness? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, because it's not that we have the answers, but we're asking the right questions now. Mm -hmm. We have some good theories, we have testable theories, we have uh, predictions that, that are made that can be tested, and uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of s science uh, to do about consciousness. Again, we're not claiming we have the solution, but we're asking the right questions now, mm -hmm. so we are changing to the science of consciousness. A somewhat controversial move, some people weren't happy, but so be it. And your orc or theory that you developed with Sir Roger Penrose, the great mathematical physicist, one of the uh, developers of the whole theory of black holes, uh, that theory has now been around for 20 years and has withstood uh, a lot of criticisms over that period of time. Quite harsh criticisms. Um, there was actually a preemptive strike against us by Patricia Churchland, a well-known reductionist materials philosopher, uh, before we even published our first article. Uh, we were working on it, but as uh, Roger's wife, Vanessa, told me, you have to be patient because Roger's very meticulous, he's way overcommitted, and nothing goes out until he's completely happy with it. Mm -hmm. So. We we had been working on it for a while, but I've been talking about the ideas online and uh, uh, at conferences, and uh, Pat Churchland had heard Roger speak about it at Cambridge, and she published a, uh, an attack piece in the Journal of Consciousness Studies uh, claiming that uh, he was all wrong about Girdle and that microtubules couldn't be uh, the, the uh, conveyor of consciousness 
For example, because uh, a drug called colchicine, which is used for gout, mm -hmm. acts by depolymerizing microtubules. Yeah. And as she pointed out, well, if you take colchicine for gout, you don't lose consciousness. The problem with that argument was colchicine, A, doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, B, doesn't aff only affects microtubules that are actively assembling and disassembling, mm -hmm. and the ones in the brain are quite uh, stable. And uh, the third factor was that if you do inject it into rats, into the brain, mm -hmm. as somebody had done for ra uh, in rats, it pretty much wiped, wiped them out. So we were able to counter that and uh, her uh, their attack so annoyed Roger that uh, we got a, a paper out in two weeks after <laughs> after uh, spending a year uh, uh -huh. on our main manuscript. I see. Well, so, I can relate to this story because I've had gout and I've taken uh -huh. colchicine and, and I can attest it did not alter my no. consciousness. No, it actually works by paralyzing the lymphocytes and the macrophages which migrate into the joint to gobble up the urate crystals and when they do, they release a bunch of toxins and they cause swelling and inflammation and, it, and that's what causes the pain. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, by paralyzing the colchicine you leave the uric crystals there but uh, the uric acid crystals there but uh, uh, you don't have the inflammation due to the uh, the white cells. Yeah. So uh, that's that's how it works but it doesn't get into the brain. Well that's a digression uh, but let, let's focus a little bit more on consciousness itself. Now this is part five of our six part <coughs> series so I hope viewers will uh, find a way to watch the uh, previous portions if they haven't already because we've covered a lot about uh, your your theory about how the brain operates, how consciousness operates inside of the brain, I think it's interesting to note that your theory is consistent with another interesting approach coming from the field of cosmology. The anthropic principle in cosmology suggests that consciousness exists in the universe itself and may be responsible for actually shaping the universe to support human life. Well, one uh, solution to the anthropic principle does and that's mm -hmm. the one we agree with. But basically, uh, it turns out that there are about 22 numbers, uh, cosmological parameters that, that define the universe. Mm -hmm. the, the mass of the electron, the charge of the electron, the, the ratio of the charge and the mass of the proton to the neutron, uh, the, uh, the uh, cosmological parameter of the expansion of the universe, the, uh, the dark energy f factor, so on and so forth, about 22 numbers. These are the various constants used in the uh, formulations of cosmologists. Correct. And uh, the question is how constant are they? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if it, the bottom line is that if they weren't exactly how they are, then uh, stars producing light, life and consciousness could not exist. We wouldn't be here. So the odds of these 22 numbers being precisely what they are are just astronomical, mm -hmm. cosmological, beyond uh, comprehension in terms of the statistical anomaly uh, that, that, uh, that does this. And so there's two basic approaches to explaining this. One is that uh, there are an infinite number of overlapping universes. Mm -hmm. and this plays into the multiple worlds hypothesis, the so-called multiverse. And the idea there is that there's an infinity of universes and uh, we happen to be in the one universe that's uh, capable of supporting life and consciousness. Mm -hmm. We won the cosmic lottery. And we are the only one, uh, we uh, are here, therefore we're the ones asking the questions. Mm -hmm. And all those other dark, cold universes, there's nobody there to ask them. So that that's called the weak anthropic principle. Mm -hmm. Now, the strong anthropic principle uh, suggests that um, that actually consciousness is intrinsic to the universe and is one of those parameters, or is related, or influences those parameters. And over eons and eons, the parameters have evolved and mutated so that the universe is actually changing and evolving to optimize consciousness and uh, and life mm -hmm. and. Uh, in the formulation I have with Sir Roger, uh, we're, we're consistent with this. We mm -hmm. think that consciousness is intrinsic to the universe and in fact uh, was there all along before life evolved, before life appeared on Earth mm -hmm. and, for, and may have been the, the, uh, the thing that caused the origin of life. Mm -hmm. Well, um, recently um, Deepak Chopra, a, a popular writer in uh, the field of human potential and consciousness and Eastern mysticism has suggested that consciousness also guides evolution. Right. Uh, he's working with Rudy Tanzi. They have a new book called Super Genes. And uh, along those lines, uh, Deepak, who's a spiritualist or believes in the consciousness as kind of being everything, said that consciousness drives evolution, that it's not just random, mm -hmm. random mutations. And 
And uh, a few months ago, he got a lot of flack about that from uh, from somebody who claimed that this was irresponsible, new age, and, and very derogatory terms. And uh, I've been thinking uh, along the lines that the objective reduction proto-conscious events that we uh, discussed uh, previously have been occurring in the universe all along, or at least uh, since uh, the temperature was right or, or whatever, and that mm -hmm. were there prior to the origin of life. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if these are producing feelings, uh, even primitive feelings, and it, that in, in the primordial soup from which life evolved, as you know that uh, experiments have shown that uh, there's a mixture of just the right nutrients and, and lightning and water and, and temperature to allow uh, uh, organic molecules, these aromatic yes. rings, pi resonance clouds, uh, to form and the nonpolar oil-like uh, regions would stick together forming environments that are conducive to quantum effects. And so I've written uh, an article and I'm writing a book about the fact that that, that life actually started in order to access uh, feelings due to uh, uh, proto-conscious OR events in the primordial soup. Mm -hmm. That that consciousness actually was there all along. The consciousness has been in the universe, and that life formed in order to access and and take advantage mm -hmm. of this. And in fact, evolution involves not just random mutations, but uh, uh, there's a feedback fitness function uh, to optimize consciousness. Mm -hmm. That life evolved more or less to feel good and to uh, be influenced by platonic values. And by feeling good, I mean by resonating with deeper level structures in the universe that were, that were part of this multiple uh, uh, vibrational system that goes all the way down into the universe. And when you feel good, it's because you're resonating with deeper level structures. Stuart, you mentioned uh, the phrase proto consciousness OR events and of course people who have viewed the earlier interviews we've done will know what we refer to but for those who maybe haven't seen the earlier programs can yeah. we define that because I know it's crucial to your theory yeah so uh, this was Roger Penrose's uh, great contribution in his first uh, uh, book uh, uh, first book on the topic uh, the Emperor's New Mind where he said that this self collapse of the wave function due to an objective threshold uh, caused uh, uh, cause consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now this is in contradistinction to the, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation or the conscious observer effect where consciousness causes collapse. So you have a, the Schrodinger's cat dead and alive or any superposition and uh, an observer looks at it and all of a sudden it instantaneously, uh, instantaneously collapses to one or the other. The idea here is, is just the opposite that consciousness uh, comes from the collapse. That the collapse occurs spontaneously due to uh, reaching this threshold given by the uncertainty principle and and this can happen willy-nilly anywhere in 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 uh, in, in the world in in in, uh, in matter or or, or even em empty space time, uh, and that gives rise to moments of conscious experience. And so uh, uh, it's it kind of uh, puts it 180 degrees. It, it's not that consciousness causes collapse; collapse causes consciousness, mm -hmm. and is identical to consciousness. Now mm -hmm. we've gotten some flack recently from philosophers, or at least I have, who says, "Well, you're claiming an identity theory," and yes. I didn't know that that was a bad thing, but apparently it entails certain certain other aspects. But uh, we're sticking by our guns and uh, saying that consciousness is col uh, uh, is caused by collapse, or collapse causes consciousness, or they're one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the identity theory uh, in philosophy, I suppose, is akin to the idea that neural spikes are the equivalent of consciousness. That's an identity theory put forth by Patricia Churchland, our reductionist materialist friend, and uh, and that's what she says, and mm -hmm. I disagree with that for many reasons, yeah. uh, but uh, it, it is an identity theory, and uh, we're claiming a different type of identity theory that that collapse by objective reduction, which is the only type of collapse there is, uh, I would further uh, suggest, uh, gives rise to consciousness or is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Well, the main point, I suppose, of, of your perspective is that consciousness isn't a product of the brain. Consciousness exists in the universe prior to uh, the evolution of any brain. Right. Uh, that's, that, that's right. So consciousness, as Deepak says, does drive evolution, mm -hmm. uh, but in a different way than and he says, because he says, would say consciousness is everything, what I'm saying is that uh, feelings due to consciousness, due to these OR events mm -hmm. occurring uh, in the universe are promote, uh, originated life. And you know, uh, it's, uh, I'm not saying that Darwin 
was wrong. I think Darwin was just incomplete. Darwin didn't consider the origin of life. And uh, I think uh, the random mutation business only goes so far. I mean, the selfish gene idea of Richard Dawkins, why would a gene uh, want to or need to promote its survival? The want and need are, are feelings, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, without feelings, what's the motivation? Uh, just survival, for what? Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really make any sense. So I'm questioning that, And uh, but you know, most of Darwin still stands. It's just uh, a few little uh, areas here and there that need tweaking, uh -huh. I think. Well, let me step back a minute. We talked earlier about these wonderful t-shirts uh, that we're wearing, and I see Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club <laughs> Band. It reminds me of uh, a wave of uh, activity back in even the 1960s. I know you and I came out of that generation, and the Beatles and, and this album in particular uh, are expressive of uh, the use of psycho psychedelic drugs in uh, Western culture. And uh, I think uh, a lot of consciousness researchers came out of uh, out of that era. I wonder if you can comment on the role of psychedelics in the light of your theories. Right. So uh, I mentioned uh, previously that anesthesia blocks the quantum events, mm -hmm. and the psychedelic drugs uh, are all. Um, based on aromatic rings, these pi resonance clouds, the, mm -hmm. the cyclical six or five plus six rings with uh, uh, resonance clouds of electrons that are delocalized. Mm -hmm. And these are conducive to quantum events. Uh, DMT, LSD, uh, psilocybin, e, uh, serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, and dopamine, the pleasure molecule, all have these, these rings. And, we, and they're normally thought to act on receptors, but they also get inside the cell and will affect the microtubules either directly directly or indirectly through the receptors. And an experiment that I would very much like to see done, and I hope it will be done, uh, would look at the uh, the quantum resonances of microtubules in the presence of psychoactive drugs. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, uh, we can we would like to measure quantum resonances in microtubules, which Anurban Bandipati has shown occur in, in gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, uh, and uh, look at what anesthesia does, and I would predict anesthesia would take it away and then add a psychedelic, and I would predict that it would increase and enhance the, the frequency mm -hmm. and increase the quantum resonances and take us, take the subject deeper into the quantum world, deeper into uh, uh, the uh, smaller and faster levels of space-time geometry. Mm -hmm. In other words, just the opposite of anesthetics. Correct. As uh, one of the Beatles songs that I like very much said, the deeper you go, the higher you fly, the higher you fly, the deeper you go. And I think deeper you go in means going deeper deeper into the fine scale structure of the universe, mm -hmm. more intense conscious experience. That's very interesting. Uh, it also leads me to uh, probe the realm of parapsychology where uh, there's all sorts of research on uh, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, out-of-body experiences, even uh, events related to reincarnation and life after death. We have 150 years of scientific literature on these topics. Uh, yeah. They've largely been excluded from uh, discussions in academia. Right. Just like consciousness was excluded from study of the brain-mind by the behaviorists, mm -hmm. uh, these non-local effects uh, that you described in parapsychology uh, have been excluded because they don't fit with the, 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 the party line, with the common paradigm of materialist reductionism. But if you include quantum mechanics in consciousness, all bets are off. It's a Pandora's box for the reduction, reductionist because it opens the possibility for everything you just said, including mm -hmm. uh, uh, action at a distance, non-locality, uh, uh, even afterlife and uh, and reincarnation are, are possible. Because if consciousness is occurring in, in space-time geometry, um, normally in the brain, it can occur at that level at deeper levels, faster levels outside the brain. Until we have a good explanation for consciousness in the brain, we cannot exclude it outside the brain. Well, this is a little puzzling to me, I admit, because we normally think that consciousness has to be embodied somehow, but if consciousness is functioning outside of, uh, of the body, what, what contains it, what holds it? Space-time geometry, uh, mm -hmm. the universe, it's everything, it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. And what that is, is if you go, imagine you were shrinking smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And you get down to the level of cell, of cell, and smaller and smaller. You get down to the level of a molecule, and then you get to an atom. And then you get to a proton, neutron, quark. 
and you and uh, uh, an atom is roughly uh, uh, ten to the minus eighth uh, centimeter, something like that. And you keep going smaller and smaller and smaller. Now. 25 orders of magnitude smaller than that, mm -hmm. you will eventually hit the basement level of the universe, at right. least as far as we can tell. Yeah, this the is Planck length. The Planck scale. Right, yeah. 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, and very fast, 10 to the uh, minus 43 seconds. Mm -hmm. And this is this is where uh, there's a, things on the way down, if you were shrinking, uh, you might think it would be more or less smooth, but when you get to this level, there's granularity, there's there's uh, information, mm -hmm. and now this information may repeat in a f kind of like a fractal at different scales. Mm -hmm. But it's the origin. Uh, at, at, it's the origin of the universe, the structure of the universe, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's where I think consciousness can go down into this level, and that's where you get into quantum effects and non-locality, so, so things can be connected over distance and space and time. Now, when you say it's the structure of the universe, I, I presume that what you mean there is it's sort of like the ground of being upon which everything else rests. Yeah, the ground of being, that's right. And, uh, you know, what it is, nobody knows. Uh, people, you know, the string theorists like to th would say that it's uh, vibrating strings. The problem with that theory is that what are the strings vibrating in? Mm -hmm. uh, they don't give you the background uh, space-time geometry, mm -hmm. so they don't really answer the question. Plus, you need all these extra dimensions for yeah. which there's no evidence and, and probably don't exist. Uh, the other, uh, the, some other approaches include quantum geometry. These are all uh, descriptions of quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. The structure of space-time comes under that uh, that term. And it does involve a merger of quantum mechanics and general relativity, so it's, it's a big deal. Uh, quantum geometry, spin networks, Roger Penrose came out with spin networks in the 50s, I think, and this is a, the idea that the fundamental uh, stuff of which the universe is made is spin. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't really say what spin is. It's 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 a geometry. It's it's a pattern. And in the end, Roger says everything's geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, it could also be what he calls twisters, which are uh, more like uh, vortices and sheaves that kind of flower and unfold. And that kind of transcends scale because if you think of a vortex, if you go down into the vortex, you're getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are conceptual ideas. Uh, Roger has a new book coming out. Uh, fiction, faith, and fantasy in modern physics, mm -hmm. where I believe he's going to deconstruct a lot of the, uh, the uh, modern physics, which um, mm -hmm. he doesn't agree with. Yes. And following his his line, I don't agree with either. Mm -hmm. uh, string theory, extra dimensions, multiple worlds, multiverse, cosmic inflation. He kind of uh, can get rid of all of them. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one more thing. He, in the last few years, he's recently had a, a whole other uh, uh, idea that is amazing. That is that the, the Big Bang was actually preceded by another eon, mm. and that that was originated by another Big Bang, maybe mm -hmm. with small b, not big b's, uh -huh. and another and another, and that there have been a, a sequence of Big Bangs and eons in one universe. So rather than parallel universes, we have one serial universe that mm -hmm. is reborn every, I don't even know how many years, uh -huh. but, uh, and they actually, uh, they claim evidence, his, his uh, collaborator, uh, an Armenian astronomer, uh, Gurdzian, claims that they see these concentric rings in the cosmic microwave background that's a supernova from the previous eon that's imprinted in the, in the Big Bang. And the Big Bang what, didn't come from a single point. It, it, I, the way Roger described it, it's more like a brush fire uh, from, a, from a surface that has grown into, into the, the present uh, eon mm -hmm. of our universe. So one universe, serial eons. That's, that's the current thinking that I, I, in, I think makes sense. In other words, time is infinite. Well, the universe is infinite in time, and uh, the idea that it origin uh, the, the Big Bang started everything would be wrong, that mm -hmm. it goes all the way back. So, uh, yeah. yes, time would be infinite, and the origin of the universe is infinitely in the past. Mm -hmm. But I presume by that that space is not necessarily infinite. Space is, uh, I don't think, I, I think that's correct, but then you have to say, well, what is it infinite? What is it finite in? Yeah. So that one I'm going to defer to Roger. Oh, okay, I know these are mind-boggling yeah. uh, questions indeed. But, well, we've covered a lot of ground here. Uh, we've looked at the implications of the idea that uh, consciousness exists at large in the universe. So by that point of view, it would seem as if, coming back to the brain, that the brain doesn't function so much as a generator of consciousness, it's more like a, 
a, a receptor, a, a not quite a TV set that's tuning into the signal because the signal is here in the brain too. Mm -hmm. But but the, that uh, the brain is is designed through the uh, structures you've described, the microtubules and and so on to uh, access consciousness. Yes, but by the same token, our uh, the brain is not a, simply a passive receiver. Mm -hmm. uh, that be, be due to our memories, your memories, my memories, the, the history of your consciousness and mine, that your consciousness is going to be different than mine. Mm -hmm. uh, even though we may be uh, uh, accessing the same uh, platonic values and yeah. consciousness in the universe, uh, and which we're also changing. So, uh, up to a point, I would say that's true, but I think that, uh, you know, uh, we can't uh, ignore Ignore the brain and, and everything that it does because as far as we know, your consciousness and mine are different. Well, uh, it's certainly one of the main points William James made in his classic essay on the stream of consciousness. It's yes. One of the fundamental things that de defines us is that we each have our own unique memories. Right, right. And yet, there seems to be occasional leakage. Maybe people become superimposed with each other or entangled with each other. Yeah, I think uh, you know. Uh, I think there is and can be entanglement among people. Uh, I think if you're close to someone, it's probably more likely. And uh, you know, there have been a lot of studies, as you pointed out, in parapsychology, but they tend to be dismissed or ignored because a hey, they're parapsychology, which is which is kind of silly. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, having uh, heard a lot of talks by parapsychologists, I think. Their statistics are more rigorous mm -hmm. than most uh, mainstream scientists. Stuart Hameroff, thank you so much for being with me. You're very welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you for being with us. Be sure to check your channel listings for part six of our six part series on consciousness and the brain. <laughs>